Hello everybody. Today we have an absolutely fantastic episode for you, especially for fans of early American history and for our listeners from Baltimore, Maryland. Guest today, Jason, also known as Uncovered History and Ask Historians, will tell us all about the lives of the Quakers in the American colonies from their founding to their persecution in the Revolutionary War. This is not the history you usually hear about in the Revolutionary War, and Jason gives us a lot of new things to think about. Before we get to that, as it's the first episode of the month, we have our Patreon book drawing. The Patreon helps support and keep this podcast going, and your support is definitely crucial to our mission. To be entered into the book drawing, you can donate $1 a month for one entry, $5 for two, or $10 for three. Please do come support us on Patreon, because a dollar a month, you are getting over 100 hours of deep history content that you wouldn't get anywhere else. The winner this month will get to choose from a book recommended by our guest, American Revolutions, A Continental History by Alan Taylor. He notes that Taylor won the Pulitzer Prize twice for his popular historical works. It focuses on all segments of the American Revolution, and he loves it. He has not found a similar volume that covers the entire span of the war from every angle imaginable. It focuses on not just politics, the military and the elite, but religion, life for African Americans, the roles of women, and a million other areas that are often overlooked. The second choice this month is The Age of Reform, which I have just begun reading and is pitched as a landmark in American political thought. Preeminent Richard Hofstadter examines the passion for progress and reform that cover the entire period from 1890 to 1940 with startling and stimulating results. The Age of Reform searches out the moral and emotional motives of the reformers and the myths and dreams which they believed. The third choice, our historical fiction pick, is The Thin Red Line by James Jones which is described as inspired by his own experiences during the Guadalcanal campaign. James Jones' novel reigns the masterpiece of World War II fiction. We follow a cast of misfit characters, the C for Charlie Company, as they transform from fresh, terrified recruits into veteran fighters in the jungles of Guadalcanal. The result is a haunting portrait of brotherhood and combat that stands along war classics. The winner this month is, drumroll please, Miles Steffelton. Thank you for being a supporter, Miles. I will contact you on your email associated with your Patreon. The rest of you can support us at patreon.com slash historians. Now here's the show. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Today, we're thrilled to be joined by a flared member of the Ask Historians community, Uncovered History, who has flared specifically in revolutionary America and early American religion, and who has answered all sorts of interesting questions for us historians. He's better known to his friends and family as Jason Alietti, and he's a public librarian at the Balt- at Balt- in Baltimore, and he just finished his master's thesis from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where he wrote and defended The Friends They Loathed, the Persecution of Maryland Quakers During the Revolutionary War. First things first, welcome to the Ask Historian Podcast, Jason. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to be here. So I like to start these conversations with asking, um, what got you interested in history in general? Um, It's a great question. And uh, unlike, I think, a lot of people who come on to these podcasts, and I think the overall trend tends to be a lot of people developed a love of history early on, I actually didn't. I initially uh, didn't like it in high school. It was very boring to me. And then when I hit, I hit college initially, I went to a very small Christian college um, in Colorado called Colorado Christian University. And uh, my initial major there was actually philosophy and literature. And I didn't actually really like studying at all. Um, I just kind of wanted to have fun in school. Except the one thing that did get me was I had a professor who I took certain elective with who was a history professor, and I actually loved his classes. And I ended up dropping out of college because I wasn't really enjoying it, and I ended up joining the Army. And did that for four years. And then I hit a period where, for the first time, I didn't have to read books that, like, teachers were telling me to read. (laughs) So I fell in love with reading whatever I wanted, which ended up being a lot of uh, nonfiction history books. And I kind of fell in love with learning new things over the course of of that four years to the point where when I got out of the Army in 2011, I realized that I just wanted to study history. And that's kind of what I went into when I went to Towson University and... uh, just and really enjoyed it there. Would you say being in the military um, helped you develop a certain kind of interest in a certain kind of history? How would you say it influenced your um, research? I would. So initially, I really loved reading military history books, not even just like American military history, like a book that I read 
fairly early on was a book called Under Fire by Henry Barbusse, which was about was a was a fictional book that came out during the middle of the First World War, and it was just such a a powerful portrayal of what it was like to live as a kind of like a foot soldier in the middle of a giant war. And there were other books I read uh, kind of along, along those lines where I just I loved learning about kind of everyday like, like the, the masses, like what was the experience of everyday people. And when I went to my undergraduate program, I thought I was going to study military history, but I was actually really kind of surprised that I actually was drawn back to studying, wanting to study religious history. And um, the part of that was that I was studying a lot of ancient religions. Um, so I was taking classes on like ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, and I was just really kind of perplexed and amazed by kind of what I learned, especially since when you actually jump into more nuances of the myths and of their religions, you kind of see how dynamic they were. So to answer your question, and there wasn't a direct crossover except for just getting me passionate about studying history. I think that's kind of a usual pass uh, for a lot of people who start with an interest in military history. Um, our recent episode about Dunkirk, I think he referenced the same book that you just did about being, what it's like being a foot soldier in such a massive war. Um, what's, what got you interested in like the Revolutionary War? I understand you did a project um, about the Maryland 400 in the Revolutionary War. Yeah, so... I, when I was in my master's program, I had already started taking a class with a really great professor named Dr. Terry Boughton, who, uh, and he's a revolutionary war professor, um, that's a specialty, and he ended up hooking me up with a former student of his who's a historian at the Maryland State Archives. And in my program, they really wanted us to try and do internships, and I was fortunate enough to get to do a really cool internship at the archives studying this project, because uh, what essentially it was doing was they received money from a nonprofit to try and create biographies for the entire 1st Maryland Regiment. So they were called up in January 1776. They went up and served at Washington throughout uh, the war, but they're known kind of most famously for people who study the period as they were the last regiment to fight the British during the Brat Battle of Brooklyn. So they kind of were trying to hold their ground as Washington soldiers were escaping and they took really heavy casualties. They're known as the Maryland 400 because I think they were trying to do like a play on words to like the Spartan 300. Mm -hmm. But um, there was there was actually many more than 400 soldiers who were there. About 250, 260 were either killed or wounded um, or captured. Wow. And uh, and so what the project was trying to do is just trying to jump in and get to kind of piece together a lot of their lives. And it's a really cool project. Uh, I'll, I'll share the link to to their website on the Reddit link after this is over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'll definitely I'll, I'll include it in their show notes. That sounds like a really fascinating project, and I think that it's kind of a useful way of showing what historians and archivists do. Don't you think that's kind of a way of doing public history? Oh, absolutely. And it also I think kind of shows how uh, how so many different people can work on one project and bring so many things to it. Because at the end of the day, that we're trying to piece together so many different lives and stories that are that, that are spread out over all these units and it's really cool like this is a project they've been working on for years they've been working they're probably going to continue to work on it for some time and it's kind of cool to kind of see how how collaboration can really work to uncover some amazing details that we wouldn't have known about most of these people had, had it not happened uh, i think that's great and i think that also it kind of reveals why you might have gotten into as historians it's just kind of a summer project of bringing history to the masses isn't it Exactly. And just in talking about like the thing that I'm, I, I kind of said it earlier, but the thing that I'm so driven to is learning about lives that would have otherwise been left undiscovered mm -hmm. uh, or forgotten. And that was really with the heart of this project, because while they did, you know, we did some basic research um, and really good research on the commanders of the unit, we're going one by one. And really, I should say they, because I've, I've only participated in one small part of the project. But ultimately, the project looks is looking at like as many soldiers as they can possibly get information on, from privates all the way up to Colonel Smallwood, who is the leader of the regiment. That's awesome. So, um, to bring it back more specifically, the type of history you do, which is, um, very interesting to me, as it's also like one of the aspects of my research, is what what would you say is different about studying religious history from where you started with the military history? What makes religious history different from military history, like diplomatic history? Yeah, I think there's a couple of key things. So like, I'll actually even throw out a, pre a, a kind of a disclaimer that I'm actually not religious. I haven't been religious for probably about nine years. I consider myself agnostic. Um, so there's not really, for me, a direct pull into religion. I just study because it it's fascinating. 
And I think what's really fascinating about it at its heart is, at least when you're doing original research, is when you're the sources that you get to examine. When you study military history or diplomatic history, you typically get what I would call, quote unquote, official sources. Mm -hmm. So these are things that are presented by the government or officials. They're reports written by generals. They're things that are published in newspapers or published in books. And similarly, you'll have uh, elected officials for, you know, politicians. Uh, You'll have the military, obviously, you have officers and you get a lot of this history that is generated and can kind of be verified through a lot of other channels. And you don't really get that with when you study religious history, at least not in the same way. Because, you know, when you study military history, especially if you're studying in the modern era, you'll get things like after action reports, you'll get, you'll have maps, you'll know routes, like you you get so many things that can kind of be verified very easily. And you end up also studying, usually at the very top of the ladder, you know, you're studying the generals, the colonels, the decision makers, the officers. And when you study Mm -hmm. diplomatic history, of course, we're usually studying, you know, we're studying the Washingtons and the John Adams, and you're studying, you tend to study more people who are decision makers. But when you study religious history, especially during this period in America, you're really studying a, a story of, of the masses. And it's something that's, that's deeply interesting, at least to me. So, for instance, with, with my research, almost all my records that I mainly relied on were the personal records written by people who were Quakers in Maryland during the Revolution. And then I salute every historian would do so. I, you know, I take what they're saying and I try and put it up against, you know, if I have them saying that they were being persecuted or harmed for this reason at this date, I try and jump into, you know, the politics of it. I see if I can verify it with claims from the government or things like that. But it's, again, it's very personal, the sources, at least for me, they were. They were, you know, people writing about their lives, about each other's lives, about their families. And it makes it a very uh, different type of history to study just because you're, you're encompassing people who would, you know, who, who didn't really have a lot of power over their lives. They were pretty powerless. And you have to really rely on kind of their interpretation of what's happening around them a lot more. Right, right. That makes sense. What, to, to focus on the Quakers, what can you tell us about the Quakers? I think, um, well, speaking for myself at least, and maybe a lot of Americans, I think we have a general idea about the Quakers, that there's some sort of uh, religious sect. Um, they, they quake supposedly because they quake in fear. I'm 100% sure where the name comes. I know they're very popular and they're spread around Pennsylvania. Um, and I guess uh, they're probably around some of those states. But where do they come from? What makes them different? So the Quakers actually stem from, essentially, they came out of the aftermath of the English Revolution in the middle of the 17th century. They were founded by a man named George Fox, who was kind of a traveling preacher. And he founded what would, would be called known as the Religious Society of Friends. The name Quakers actually came from, at least according to the stories, came from a judge who mocked them when they were appearing in court one day, who was saying that like when they prayed or when they were worshiping they were shaking or trembling and then started calling them quakers Um, at least that's that's the story uh according to the quaker sources Mm -hmm. but um they're they have a really fascinating uh history so they they were born out of this very very violent period and very turbulent period and of clashing ideas and obviously militaries in the 17th century and they uh, and george fox was able to get some followers by going around and preaching a very different type of Christianity. There was a lot of people around him who didn't like it. He actually was jailed several times between 1649 and 1652. But by the time he gets out of prison in 1652, he's already amassed actually a decent number of Quaker followers. The exact number I haven't ever been able to, and I think any historian has ever been able to pinpoint, but it's, it looks, they were definitely spread out. And by 1655, within just three years, they were definitely having meetings throughout England, which is really interesting. They separated themselves, though, from traditional Christians or non-Quaker Christians, and that pertains at least to my research in three main ways. So the first one is that George Fox, he unveiled this idea that people were spiritually equal in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. And he means that, you know, across ages, across genders, it was no person really has, you know, has more precedence in the eyes of God. And it really had big impacts on the way that Quakers were viewed both internally and externally. Because internally, it meant that women were equal to men. Children could also preach and minister. It was very interesting for its time period. And it meant that women could be spiritual equals to men, which is 
in a period where women had very little rights, this is a pretty big uh, stepping stone for women to be able to have a bigger, larger voice than just being inside a household. Mm-hmm. The, uh, they also had no official ministers or, um, or preachers. Their services were very quiet, so they would mostly be silent meetings. Um, they didn't call them churches. They called them meetings. And they would essentially just have very quiet uh, worship sessions with no music. And if somebody felt compelled through God or through the Holy Spirit to speak, they would. Their, so this already got them looked at as her- heretics by their non-Quaker neighbors, but other things kind of clashed for them. So their beliefs also impacted some of their civil duties, I guess you could say. So Jesus's teachings on pacifism, they took to be literal truths. So when Jesus was saying, you shouldn't strike your neighbor, they took that literal. So they believed that no Quaker should ever partake in war, should never train for war, should not pay war taxes, because that would be essentially paying somebody else to go to war for them. And similarly, they also took other church teachings uh, or, or biblical teachings like Matthew 5.34. Jesus is, instructs his followers to always tell the truth and to never take oaths because if they're always telling the truth, then oaths are pointless. Mm-hmm. And as a result, they refuse to ever mm-hmm. take oaths. And this has immediate impl- implications for them because when they get subpoenaed to court or they're brought before anyone, they refuse to ta- to swear in. And it just creates a lot of problems for them. And had a lot of problems for them when they hit America when loyalty oaths become mandatory in many states and they refuse to take them. And then the last one I would say that makes them stand out was more cultural. But they didn't believe in following typical social norms in some ways. So they didn't recognize the British nobility or aristocracy when they were talking to them. So like if they met the Earl of Essex, they wouldn't refer to him as your lordship or Earl Capel. They would just call him Arthur. And if they met his wife, they wouldn't refer to her as lady. They would just call her Elizabeth. And if you can imagine... Mm. 17th century customs <laughs> it's just like it, exactly like they Very would be upset displeased. like they, and it, 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 if you look at them especially during that early period they're constantly like, like there's so many members who are constantly in prison they're having things seized from them they, there's just all these things happening to them and they took it as like hey look i think we're on the right path <laughs> if people are getting so angry at us this is probably a sign that we're doing good work and so, yeah that's kind of like the early history when they how they were founded so to i guess fast forward a little bit and bring us to the new world, how did they end up over here in America, in Pennsylvania? And um, I guess you said there are some of them prevalent in uh, Maryland as well? So what's interesting is that while they're most known for being in Pennsylvania, they don't actually, they actually arrive in America decades earlier. The first Quakers arrived, the actual very first one was a woman named Elizabeth Harris. She arrived in Maryland or Virginia. It's unsure which one, but she went to both. She arrived there in 1655 to 1656. Huh. which is actually really surprising because it's less than five years after they were really formally founded. And you actually see that again, where another woman named Mary Dyer, she actually immigrates to Massachusetts uh, about a year later. And it's, you kind of see this as a common trend where a lot of the first minister, I shouldn't say uh, missionaries that come over are actually women. And uh, a lot of Quaker historians have attributed it to the idea that look, mm-hmm. this is a way for women to take leadership roles and be able to have power in ways that they never would have been able to have had they stayed in England. And so they arrive, um, they experience persecution all over the place. Definitely was worse in Massachusetts because as soon as they start to arrive, they're banished from the colony and they keep coming back. And between 1659 and 1661, four Quakers, including Mary Dyer, is that, are actually executed. Wow. And uh, it actually forces King Charles II to intervene and essentially tell uh, the Massachusetts and New England colonies, you can't kill people for having even heretical beliefs, uh, at least not Quaker beliefs. And it kind of calms things a little bit, but it's, it's a bit of time for them before they're able to practice openly in the area without harassment, because uh, they're still jailed for it. In Maryland, it's a little different. The Quakers who first start coming over, they arrive in a very turbulent period. They arrive near where present-day Annapolis is, And it's coming at the very end of a long struggle between the Puritan settlers in the colony and the proprietary governor, Lord Baltimore, his Catholic, his war with largely Catholic forces Mm -hmm. against them. Like they arrived literally at the same area where a battle called the Battle of the Severn, named after the river, just took place. And it's a real war over clashing religion and clashing ideals and identity. And so the Quakers show up and they, and 
when by the time they, they start coming over in not really in mass, like there's only probably about 50 of them that show up by 1660. But by the time that they're there, they, there's already this sense of not trusting them. So the government uh, under Lord Baltimore issues a decree or, uh, or a proclamation that every man in military age needs to train for the militia. And this is to protect against Native Americans, but mainly to protect against Puritans if they try to take up arms against us again, from his point of view. And the Quakers largely say, no, like we can't do that. And they face persecution, but very different from what they experience in Massachusetts, their persecution largely is some of it is related to like being in prison, but there's no executions and it's mostly having property seized because they're being taxed. They refuse to pay the tax and then officials come and just seize their goods. They're seizing horses, cows. If they're most of them are planters, so they're having shipments of like 500 pounds of tobacco seized. And this just keeps happening to them throughout the 1660s until kind of the tide settles and they pass a law allowing people who have religious convictions that preclude them from military service from having to serve. And that kind of begins a very moderate form of tolerance in the colony for really for until the revolution comes. That's interesting. Um, I hadn't realized just from my elementary and high school education that there was such religious turmoil between the various colonies and War between Puritans and Catholics and uh, Catholics trying to force Quakers and doing various things. I didn't realize how uh, aggressive it had gotten. I think that was one of the things that uh, that appealed to me when I was studying this initially. Because I went into, before I even discovered my thesis, I was just trying to learn about religion in America. Because I knew when I hit grad school, I wanted to study something in American religious history. Yeah. And I, I had my mind blown away. I was just, I was just like, you know, I, I had never heard of any of this. And people, many people died, especially in these like clashes, uh, in these in these skirmishes. That you know, it, it's just crazy. It seemed crazy to me that I hadn't been taught that up until this point. Because you typically think of people fleeing religious persecution from Europe. You don't think of there being religious intolerance right here on American soil years after people had already fled for the same reasons. Mm-hmm. You didn't really touch on it in that past answer, but why why are they so closely associated with Pennsylvania? Oh, so. Pennsylvania's history is a little bit different. So this all stuff, uh, everything I mentioned here happens in like the 1650s and 1660s. Mm-hmm. Immigration of Quakers actually ramps up in Maryland a bit more in the 1660s and 70s, but there's still not really a lot of tolerance. And what ends up happening is in the 1680s, of an entrepreneur named William Penn, who was a Quaker, petitioned King Charles II and asked if he could have a, essentially have land to protect all Quakers, not just all Quakers, but essentially all Christians from religious persecution. And he ends up getting um, the charter for Pennsylvania. They start settling it in like in the 1680s. And right from the start, it's actually a very open and egalitarian society uh, if you're a Christian. So people who were Jewish, for instance, didn't really have any of these advantages that that I'm about to go over. But the only thing you had to do is declare that you believe that Jesus from the Bible was a was divine. And that was essentially it. You could worship openly. If you were a minister, you could purchase property for a for your church, which was not the same everywhere. Maryland, for instance, after the Glorious Revolution in 1688, Catholic churches actually couldn't own their own property. Uh, the, the property was seized from them. That's right, yeah. So, so for them, it ends up being a place where they try to potentially tell everyone, hey, no matter what, if you're a Christian, you can come here. And it's a very different culture from it because they... Right from the beginning, the their their general assemblies are open. Uh, there's not as many restrictions for land ownership or for wealth to be able to run or vote. I mean, there's still some, but there's not as much as you'll see in other states. And there's no religious tests. Uh, there was another, in, for instance, in Maryland, there's a religious test that comes out after the Glorious Revolution because it instills a, the uh, Anglican Church as the official church of the colony. And you end up needing to essentially declare loyalty to the Anglican Church in order to hold any significant political office. At least that's the way that it's set up originally. Whereas in Pennsylvania, you don't have to. So although the Quakers have dominance, they end up having majority control of the state legislature for almost 75 years until the French and Indian War. So they just have a very different set of circumstances. Quakers who are emigrating start coming in mass to Pennsylvania. The other people who come to Pennsylvania end up 
converting to Quakerism, it just flourishes to the point where by the time the revolution picks up, there's probably somewhere around out of the 300,000 free white population in Pennsylvania, at least 100,000 are Quakers, possibly more. Whereas in Maryland, out of the 150,000 people who were living in Maryland, only about 3,000 or about 2% of Maryland's population were Quakers. So, And you can see why there's a huge difference for it. You want to go, mm-hmm. obviously, where you can worship without problem, where you don't have a history of being treated inhumanely, and, uh, and where you can also vote and actually have a say in what goes on. So, yeah, why did you choose to focus on the Maryland Christians? Because they're more persecuted and they're more isolated? I got... I found this project actually when I was at the Maryland Archives, and the 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 historian who I was working with um, was fortunate enough to kind of show me the, these records, and I realized a couple of things about them right from the start. So the first one was that the story of Maryland Quakers is largely not known. Um, most historians who have studied Quakers study it almost exclusively on Pennsylvania. The few books that have been written that include it really either one of them which was a fantastic history by a man named arthur meekle he studied quakers across all the colonies for the american revolution but most of his research is on pennsylvania because many of the reasons i just said and he also and but his focus on maryland quakers is reduced to about four pages which is it's but it doesn't tell a complete story it just it just lists some of the laws that the maryland government listed adored enacted against quakers but doesn't actually say what actually happened to Quakers who experienced them. The other part too was there was the very first thing I did after I read the, some of these primary sources, which essentially was just an accounting of the persecution happening to Quakers, was I realized I didn't know enough about Maryland history uh, in terms of religion. So there was one monograph written on it and I went and uh, got it from my school's library. And the thing I was shocked at was that I had I had just come from, uh, literally same day, I had just come from the archives where it just listed, where Quakers were listing how they experienced persecution on a mass level for not taking loyalty oaths, refusing to serve in the militia, and refusing to pay war taxes. And then this monograph that was written in the 1970s was saying how Quakers were respected by the state, they were never asked to take loyalty oaths because their loyalty was never in question. And pretty much everything he wrote, which was only really a couple of paragraphs, almost every single thing he wrote was actually wrong, as if he actually hadn't even done research. <laughs> he was just making it up. And I was just like, this seems crazy. Like, this is insane. So it kind of began on my journey of like trying to see, okay, well, I have these records by the Quakers. Let me, so I jumped into those. And then I was trying to see what other supporting evidence I could get from on the behalf of the government, letters that officials were writing. I was trying to jump into as much as I could to see how much of their story seemed to be corroborated by other evidence. This is funny to me because um, my research started when I was reading a book called Male Morality in the 19th Century. And it basically was making the argument that like, oh, well, pornography in the 19th century was way worse than ever was any time in history. And I'm like reading it and reading. I'm like, everything he's talking about is wrong. And I need to like write my, uh, my class paper on it. But then I wrote my thesis on it and then I wrote a book on it I just couldn't stop I, you're really wrong man yeah because it, it can be frustrating yeah it's um, super frustrating yeah I, I, I can't even imagine I, I can I can understand a little bit just because as I was reading this I, I remember sitting there in the archives thinking I like th- this guy wrote a book but I just found everything he said to be wrong based on two hours worth of research when I didn't even really understand the context yet <laughs> so um, it was it just seemed kind of crazy to me and that's why I, I felt like I was kind of compelled to that moment to right well this is the project right that makes sense so you, I saw that you mentioned in your thesis that the Maryland government was facing a lot of problems at the time um, internally was that part of what was contributing to this persecution of the Quakers yeah so the Maryland government during the revolution which again they don't really teach us in high school which I wish they did but when they teach high school history, they tend to teach it from like the Massachusetts or Pennsylvania perspective, just mass support from everyone, people, you know, democratic ideals being adopted, the idea that, you know, in Pennsylvania, for instance, one of the first things that changed with the uh, Pennsylvania Constitution is they break down barriers so people can vote. Will they eliminate the land holdings that you previously had to have in order to vote? And they also eliminate any barriers based on race. So the uh, the initial first constitutional Pennsylvania that was passed allowed about 90% of the men in the state to vote. This included freed slaves. 
And so that, that's like a pretty, de- you know, from our perspective, it would be a pretty big democratic adoption of, of these principles. And similarly in Massachusetts, there's a lot of, of wave of democratic ideals are floating around and states are jumping on board. This is not what happened everywhere. Places like Maryland actually were, were what I would say, are, were very tame in adopting any of these principles. So internally, they looked at, uh, they tried to figure out, the, the Maryland gentry tried to figure out, essentially, what is the least amount of democracy we can give to people, but still get them to support us in this revolution against Great Britain. <laughs> and whereas in Pennsylvania, where people were able to start being able to vote, n- not just, uh, you know, their assemblymen, but they could also vote on some elected officials, uh, sorry, local elected officials, Maryland's government really doesn't do that. The only extra person a person can vote for is the local sheriff. They also put real restrictors on who could even run. So if Maryland had two House legislatures, only about 9% of the population could even run, and 9% of the free white male population could run, and about 7% could run for sheriff, and that was about it. The upper chamber of the House and the governor would not be elected by popular vote, and really nothing else is left up to them. So what you end up seeing is there's a lot of people in Maryland who just don't want to serve in in the militias or in, in the Continental Army. There's a lot of internal problems with it. I mean, at one point in 1777, there's actually a massive riot in Baltimore. Baltimore is just a town. It has a population of around 5,500 and 700 men riot for several days over it to the point where they end up having to call militias from other counties to come in to put down like the protesting and the rioting. And this happens throughout the state. There's places in just outside of Maryland's capital, Annapolis, they can't even field militias properly. And they're having to do constant like court martials and giant headache because people, there's just not overwhelming support for the revolution. And even worse is that, um, so Maryland is divided by the Chesapeake Bay, which creates a problem for the, for the Patriot government because they can't really control what's going on on the Eastern shore. From almost the beginning, from 1776, Maryland's Eastern shore is very loyalistic they're fielding companies or regiments of, of loyalist troops, and they're going up to support the British army. The, this happens a couple of times throughout the war, and it just creates a... So Maryland is faced with looking at having a ton of internal dissent from people who don't want to support the revolution, and a ton of hotbed dissent on the eastern shore, people who are literally taking up arms against them. Just to bring us right back to right before the war, how are the Quakers treated before the war and did they act differently during the build up to the war versus other loyalists in different colonies? The so the um the interesting thing with, with the Quakers is that they essentially reach unofficial compromise with the Anglican government around seventeen hundred. By seventeen hundred the Quakers are not really being tolerated again, but they agreed to a new law that essentially was a mandatory clergy tax or Anglican church tax. And the government essentially says, we will, won't force people to serve in the militias or do anything against your beliefs as long as you pay this tax. So the Quakers, who for their belief system, it's always been seen as heretical to pay a tithe or a clergy tax, they agree to pay it. And they pay it for really, the, you know, until the Revolutionary War. And so there's this very somber tone, I guess, between the Quakers and the government where they're, you know, where both sides are just tolerating each other and just kind of moving on. Uh, even though the Quakers aren't really experiencing anything great. And it just, it changes though, as soon as the war starts. What happens when the war starts, particularly between the Quakers, could they, like you mentioned earlier, they had a belief that you can't pay war taxes. Did they, did the relationship dramatically change when the war started because of that? Yeah, almost from, from the immediate moment. So in 1776, the government realizes that they need to field troops and they need to protect themselves in case the United Kingdom or Great Britain it uh, invades the state. So like almost every state, they create a law that mandates all men have to train the militias. They do not allow for Quakers or anybody to abstain due to religious convictions. If you don't want to serve, you can pay like a, what's called a muster fine, uh, which was relatively low, but it could actually be pretty high. The scale of it was anywhere from like 30 shillings a month to like four pounds which was a lot of money. Yeah, it's a ton of money. Uh, but for the most, but mainly it, the reason why it was, it was so big though was that that way people who, you know, if I was just a farmer living outside of Baltimore and I don't really want to have to serve, I can just pay, if I'm willing just to pay that 30 shillings, it was just 
money that was flowing into the government, so they didn't really question it. The higher one was really for people who refused to pay the lower fine, and then they would try and come back and say, hey, you owe us more money. And that's kind of how, how the government kind of initially gets off with, with at the beginning of the war. And then the, the Quakers agree to go along with that? Not really. The, initially, so the for everybody else, most people in Maryland are, at least uh, who are not loyalists, are pretty much okay with the current status quo, at least initially. And the Quakers essentially just, they refuse. They're just like, no, we can't do any of these things. It's inappropriate. Uh, by the time 1777 rolls around, as I mentioned that there was rioting starting to happen in some cities and with the loyalists in the Eastern Shore, the Maryland government thinks, hey, we need to force people to declare their loyalty. So they create a loyalty oath that they expect every colonist or the oldest man in, in, of every family to declare for his family. And the Quakers, likewise, they, they can't take oaths. They right, can't do right. it. In Pennsylvania, they got around it because they allowed Quakers to just affirm that. And it was very, the wording of theirs is very different, but it essentially allowed them to affirm that they wouldn't stand in opposition to the Patriot government. The Maryland government wants them to uh, swear loyalty to the government, which from their perspective was very, was made them very uncomfortable. So right from, from 1776 onward, they, the fines I mentioned earlier start racking up for Quakers all across the state, and the government sends people out to collect on them. And when Quakers refuse to give money, a lot of them is because they have no money on them, because they were, most of them were pretty poor. They start seizing their property. They, they'll seize anything from wheat or cash crops like tobacco to horses, cows, sheep. They'll start seizing almost anything right from the start. And they'll just say, this is in payment for that. And usually it was quite more what was seized than what the the total was even of. Right, right. But they were just trying to make an example of them in a sense, right? Exactly. And it was also the difference too with Quakers was that even though they were a small part of the population, they were a population that wasn't going to actually fight back. When there's issues in Baltimore County where a lot of people don't want to pay the fines and it becomes a headache for the government officials there because now they have to send possibly armed men. Like it just creates a whole headache. But here, hey, we can send one person to a Quaker farm and seize um, his horse or four of his uh, cows, and he's not going to even fight us. That's a really easy way to take advantage of the situation. Yeah, yeah. So for them, they just create themselves as easy targets because while they're pacifistic and they won't fight a war, they also won't, you know, they won't punch someone for trying to take their their property. So where do they generally fall on the whole uh, decision of? loyalists or rebels to the british government do they tend to fall on either side or they generally speaking the maryland quakers don't really take a they don't take a hard line either way for the most part they really want to remain neutral they do have a by the time 1778 is the first year where persecution against them like the fines and the seizures really spike and it hit a lot of families it hit the majority of the families in the state and some people just don't don't like it. So that you and they, they just can't handle it. So about thirty one people decide that they're going to train with the militia or join the Continental Army, and they're therefore disowned in their communities. And so th- those are like that's really the only wave of support you would see towards the Patriot side. Generally speaking, there really wasn't much loyalistic support, although Patriots said that they were. So there's a lot of rumors that pop up during that early period that are saying that there's companies of armed Quakers on the Eastern shore that are marching up to fight with the British. And we wholeheartedly know that's not true. There's so much evidence that says that isn't true. The only evidence we have that there was any support at all was that there were three Quakers who were caught uh, trading uh, food like wheat with the British army when they were uh, occupying Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That's really the only evidence, like hard evidence that ever came out of what happened. And the fact is, though, that like in newspapers and in in conversations and letters that people are writing to each other, they believe that Quakers on the Eastern Shore are disloyal. So kind of even though it's not really happening, the fact that they're spreading these rumors, it really kind of heightens up this idea of not only the, the Eastern Shore being a hotbed of loyalists, but the Quakers are just all oh, we, we can't trust them. They're terrible. Right. That makes sense. Um that there's always that kind of attitude towards outsiders or we can assign all the negative feelings or fears that we have towards these outsiders that won't go along with what the rest of us are doing in a sense. Exactly. And also the problem too, is that there were also Methodists on the Eastern shore who are another minority religion mm-hmm. that were kind of more openly supporting the British. 
And it also kind of put, again, this very bad taste in, in people's mouths for these lesser known religions are likely just siding with, with the British. Because again, they're viewed as outsiders. Are there any um, important Quaker figures that we should be aware of um, when the war gets started and starts going underway? Um, when does Maryland, like as Maryland becomes involved more involved in the war, are there more Quaker figures that stand out as leaders? The so there's nobody who um, there's no like major figures that would probably stand on the national stage, but in their communities, the two people that seem to have been doing uh, or at the forefront of trying to fix the problem was there was a man named George Matthews and another named James Barry. And the two of them were essentially involved with everything that happened. They were traveling to Pennsylvania to try and meet with other Quakers to get advice on what they should do. They were sometimes bringing back supplies for families that were struggling. They were also uh, in charge of committees for petitioning the Maryland government to respect their beliefs and understand that they weren't going to stand in opposition to the government. And essentially everything that came up, the, those two men constantly were trying to take the lead on and try and help make things better for, for their communities. So one of the things they're doing when they're per- pressure, persecuting these Quakers and taking their sheep and horses and, and various property, that, that's obviously caused a great hardship. I mean, it's kind of like state sponsored persecution how do the how does the community respond in what ways do they try to resist within their religious um belief so they really do two things so first is they internally clamp down at any internal dissent so if anybody there's several people who like were who took the loyalty oath uh in the early in like 77 and 78 and again i mentioned that there were some people who did join the militias and were disowned for it but they essentially jump down at everyone. Every single meeting essentially comes together and they're like, hey, if you do any of these things, you're out. Like, we're not we're not playing around. And most people fall in line for it. The other thing they do is they realize we have to get a proper accounting of what exactly is happening to us. That way we can petition the government to respect us. So Quakers, uh, whenever they're going through periods of, of persecution, they create what's called the meeting for the suffering. This happened in Maryland, but it also happened all over the place. It happened in England during their periods uh, of the early founding it happened in really the American colonies whenever they had problems. So they come together and they essentially just do accountings of what every single person is losing that uh, as long as what they've lost is greater than one pound. So if, if what was if you were too poor and they came and they just seize say your hat, which they actually did do, they would seize things as little as like a hat, they wouldn't account for it just because it was too little for them. So the uh, what they ended up have happening was they would create these accountings, and then they would send the two men I mentioned earlier, George Matthews and James Berry, they and sometimes other people would go to the Maryland General Assembly and try and read off a statement saying, hey, this is what's happening to us. This is how bad it's affecting us. We're not here to oppose you. Can you please respect us? And they did that a couple of times throughout the war, although the Maryland government constantly, they, they heard them, like their letters were read. They met even with, with elected officials, but Every single time, they are essentially ignored. Uh, right before the war is over, they finally even get a vote in the General Assembly, which they weren't even allowed to. They didn't even reach that point. Mm-hmm. And then, and when they finally get a vote, it's like they're just destroyed. Like they have almost no votes in favor of them. So that's kind of, uh, kind of, <laughs> that's really the only way they can survive through it. Is they essentially just say, "Hey, we're just going to wait this out, and hopefully the war will be over soon." which eventually, you know, right before the war was over is when they stopped taxing them and seizing all their property. And just to put it into perspective, too, I realized I didn't actually give any real numbers. So, for instance, most of the fines that were happening that they were accounting for was between about 12 pounds and 30 pounds, Mm -hmm. which in today's dollars would be around $2,600 to $6,600, which is actually quite a bit of money, especially for people who are most of them were, like, America during this period was experiencing almost like a Great Depression. So people were struggling financially. And so even in my $6,600, like I try to tell people is, imagine if somebody like took your car, you know, that was your car to get to work. Yeah. And now you had to come up with another car yeah. to get to work. And, you, you know, it's like the idea of pulling out $6,600 from, from nowhere to just do your job, you know, to run a farm or do anything, is, it's really hard to do. And this is in the middle of a war. Right, and I'm, I'm imagining a lot of these are also like subsistence farmers. Exactly, most of the small, yeah, ninety five percent of the state are small farmers. People who you know had probably around a fifty to a hundred acres of land, 
which is enough usually to grow for your own family and maybe sell some, you know, at the market. Over the course of the war, which um, lasts quite quite a long time, uh, but Maryland does seem to struggle, doesn't it? It se- doesn't seem to like have as good of a time of it as um, a lot of the other states do because of how the British military was operating through it, right? Yeah, I mean, Maryland just struggles, uh, similarly, similarly to what I was kind of saying earlier, Maryland's government just struggles uh, overall. They have very lackluster support internally. They have a lot of external people who just don't want to be a part of it. And Maryland's government uh, essentially just tries to, they're, they're trying to put out too many fires at once. Mm-hmm. And it just cre- it creates a lot of internal problems for them throughout the war. And it even still happens even a little after the war is over where the government is just not, it doesn't function well. Like they're, they're not doing well with collecting taxes. A lot of people still don't support the, the government. Uh, at, they end up lowering requirements for voting after the war is over and people still aren't showing up to vote. And it's just, it's overall just, there's just not a lot of, I guess, like Maryland pride, quote unquote, uh, <laughs> after, you know, during or even after the war is over. So as the war begins to wind down, and like you said, they stop being, um, uh, their property stops getting seized. Are they able to recover? Does it take them longer to recover from this? So they kind of recover, but they kind of don't. And, it, and this is not just the same for Maryland. It's also happening in other states. So they were all, Pennsylvania Quakers were experiencing persecution as well, but at a much lower rate. Like the numbers that I actually use in my, that I kind of prove in my thesis is Maryland Quakers experience about three times per person, like three times the financial impact of what Quakers in Pennsylvania were experiencing. Wow. And, and, but even in, in Pennsylvania, like the Quaker communities uh, s- struggle a little bit after the war is over. And there's a couple of reasons for that. In Maryland, one of the things that split families or split communities apart was that while the war was going on, a conversation over abolition, which began in the 1760s, where Quakers, Quaker leaders were trying to get everybody to abolish slavery, they keep bringing it up throughout the revolution to the point where there it there's they talk more in the early years of the war while they're being persecuted about about slavery and about abolition in their meetings than they do about the fact that like families are being financially like destroyed and because for them it was such a moral issue and you have some communities that start freeing slaves by mid 1770s and it's an issue that really does divide communities continued and i think part of it is that these communities are already ones that were under financial significant financial strain Many of them have farms, um, like a lot of America, some of them have farms that are foreclosed on after the war is over because they have no money. And then you have to throw on top of that now these requirements to free slaves. And again, it just it just divided communities. And mix that in also with the greater picture of religion in America, which the seven, after 1790, there's a period of religious revivalism where a lot of these newer forms of religion, and I say newer in a relative term, but like Methodism and Baptists and certain other sects explode with popularity and it's you see some people some quakers do convert to them so there's just a whole hotbed of things that have kind of happened after the revolution for kind of how how they change what else happens to them after the revolution do they kind of uh manage to stick around in maryland or do they end most of them end up moving elsewhere almost from my research almost nobody actually moved wow uh at least not not for the persecution aspect of it the tendency for Quakers tended to be that if you're being persecuted, you, you're supposed to ride it out, kind of be like an example of what it means to to endure hardship in the name of, of Jesus. So a lot of them just don't leave the state. And if they, if they do, it was unlikely because of, you know, fi- the, the financial impacts of the war. Because the truth is, if you don't have like the money to buy a horse, it's way more difficult to try and move somewhere, get land and set up a new farm especially because a lot of the Quakers here, a lot of them were tenant farmers. Mm -hmm. So they were renting somebody else's land. Now we have to find somebody else to rent land from. And there's the 1780s too, and this is a whole different discussion, but the 1780s in America was a period for the most part of economic collapse. So it just wasn't, it wasn't like a lot of, there wasn't a, a lot of economic opportunities to be able to move or do anything without losing everything. Like if you were to move, you would likely leave almost everything and just go with whatever you could carry, which would be difficult for anybody wanting to set up a farm. So to, to draw us towards a sort of conclusion, what do you think is important to take away from the Quaker experience in, in a Maryland, um, and I guess in the Revolutionary War as a whole, whole? Like how does the story of Maryland Quakers fit into the broader stories of revol- religion during the Revolutionary Era? 
I, I think they fall in line with a couple of things. Uh, so the first one is, I think they're a good example of showing how the concept of religious tolerance wasn't really a concept at the time. Like, I think we often think of, when you think, you know, American Revolution and founding ideals, we think of things like freedom of religion. The government should never uh, force somebody to, you know, into changing who they are for, you know, you know, arbitrarily. Mm-hmm. And the, what you end up seeing in this situation is the government did exactly that. They were coming in and they were forcibly, cha- you know, getting a whole entire group of people to change and go against their beliefs. And uh, it falls in line kind of with that idea. And this is what we see throughout the early period, which is religious tolerance just wasn't a, wasn't a, wasn't something that was established. You also see there's a really great historian named John Butler who's done amazing research into Christianity in early America. And he actually kind of focuses on that quite a bit, which is where I kind of saw my own research kind of reflecting a little bit off of. And, uh, and I would also kind of just point out too, that the overall issue with America at this period too, is America just wasn't religious. Only about 50% of Americans belong to a church or attend it one annually. There's some historians who have debated that a little bit, but I mean, the at best, the most, the highest estimate I ever saw was 30%. Mm-hmm. And even that to me seems really, really high. And this kind of shows, though, that like when people aren't very religious um, and they're met with what we would probably say are religious fundamentalism, which is weird to kind of think of Quakers in that way, uh, it creates some sort of distrust between the two groups, especially though, because if we're being honest, like the, the people who were actually in power, would most of them would call themselves Anglican. There were some Catholics, there were some others, but they didn't actually attend church regularly. But they still saw, though, that these other groups as not being um, as not being like true Christians, I guess you would say, right. and that's why I had a problem with, with persecuting them. That that's great. I think you've given us um, probably the most comprehensive of uh, history of the Quakers in Maryland that there is out there, and I'm happy to hear that you passed your thesis defense and that it will soon be published for every people who want to go on and read it. Right? Yeah, I do. Also, have a uh, a WordPress that I just created that. As soon as it's on ProQuest, it should be able to be viewed for free. So I'm going to throw a link on there when it's put on there later this summer. Well, that's great. I, but I know we will definitely have some follow-up questions because topics like these always get these great follow-up questions about the history of the American Revolutionary War. And I'm sure you'll more, be more than capable of handing them. So I hope you'll fo- join us in the follow-up thread and ask historians. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I'm looking forward to it. And if anybody is curious about any of the stuff I said and they want any sources or anything, I have no problem posting them. So just let me know. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jason. I really enjoyed this. All right, cool. Thank you. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.